Rub up your engines! GM has a mission to become more inclusive in the people they hire, so they're dropping the four-year degree requirement for many of their positions that they previously had. You know what I say? GM's quality was enough to begin with, and if they're getting less educated people that they're going to hire because they want to become the most inclusive company in the world, well, they're not going to include me as one of their customers because I'm not going to buy their crap. I want smart people, educated people making, designing things, not, oh, we'll hire this person because they're this or that, not because of the knowledge in their head. They want to become inclusive and have everybody there, you know? <laughs> People have gotten carried away with this nonsense. They have. They absolutely have. Of course, if you look at a big company like GM, you really have to think, what's their ulterior motive? Well, they'll probably pay them less, too. Well, you don't have a college degree. You won't have to pay as much. But they're including everybody, you know? Let's include people who aren't very handy with their hands to build cars because we feel sorry for them. So what if your car's a piece of junk and it doesn't work, right? But it was inclusive of the guy. Gave him a job. They're really getting carried away with this PC crap. Much to the demise of society, if you ask me. Somebody should get a job because they're good at doing it, not because they happen to be something or something else. It should just be on the merits. I mean, it should be a merit-based society, which would make the most sense. Then the people that are good at stuff do that stuff. People that are good at something else do something else. And they don't get a job because, well, they got to hire this certain type of person because we don't have enough of them there. Who's to say that every percentage of people are good at anything? People get jobs because they're good at a certain thing, you know? I couldn't be a paint and body guy. I painted a car once. It looked horrible. I, I would not try it. I'm no good at it, you know? People should do what they're good at, and people should be hired because they're good at doing something, not because they want to add to all these people, so we're all inclusive here. It's just plain stupid. Well, here we go with electric batteries again. A company called QuantumScape promised a revolutionary battery in 2020. The company was evaluated at $54 billion, but... Pfft, not anymore. The stock went up to $131.67. Now it's like 10 bucks or so. Went right down the toilet. This fantasy of, we've got revolutionary batteries. Well, we haven't mass produced them yet. We don't know if they're going to really work in cars, but hey, throw your money at us. Throw your money. Come on. Any company that gains over 400% of their stock in four days is generally BS. People are stupid. They saw Volkswagen put money in. So did Bill Gates. Oh, they're all geniuses, right? I bet they don't have money in it anymore. Basically, the company's lost 92% of its value in less than two years. The company QuantumScape said, oh, just in a couple of years, we'll have these great new batteries out. Well, a couple of years have passed. The great new batteries are not being produced. Somehow, they're using some type of ceramics. And that's like the buzzword. It's either nanotechnology or ceramic. And Well, we got these ceramic parts, and then we want have the problem with those dendrites breaking through and shorting them out because the ceramic's hard. Well, it's not working out too well in the real world yet. They say they can recharge from 0 to 80% in 15 minutes. All these promises, of course, that have never come to fruition yet. And of course, they claim that they have hundreds of thousands of miles, and they had 80% more energy than lithium ion, and on and on and on, yet they don't really exist yet. And of course, the company today says, if we can mass produce these, it will be a radical change. Yeah, the problem is most of these things can't be mass produced. They cost too much money to mass produce. Then they find out when they make big enough ones to run cars, there's a problem with the economy of scale and that they short out in cars and don't last or start on fire. <laughs> just really, if you're smart, don't throw your money into these companies. It's just a crapshoot. They promise the moon, and then when the reality comes on, you get a piece of rotten cheese. <laughs> Alex G says, can we settle the oil dipstick question? I've heard from other YouTubers. The correct way to check engine oil was to drive the car for five minutes, park it, wait one minute, and then check the level. And it moves up and down, I notice, as it gets hot. What do you think? An engine should be checked when the oil is cold. The dipstick mark is for an engine oil when it's cold. Engine oil will expand when it heats and get a little bit higher. Now, if you want to go to really well-designed cars, Back in the day, they had a dipstick that had 
cold, and a hot level on it. That was real simple. If you wanted to check it cold, you'd check it cold and it should be at a cold level. If not, and you drove it around for five, ten minutes, whatever, then you'd park it on a level surface and wait a minute. It has to drain down, right? So it's all drained and there isn't oil stuck on the top of the engine. Then in that case, it would have been on the H, on the hot part. But they don't make most cars like that anymore. They don't have a cold and a hot. They only have the cold. You want to do it when the engine is cold, first thing in the morning, on a flat surface, and that'll tell you if it's right where it's supposed to be, which would be on most cars, either the dot or the line on the top. Like I said, they used to have cold and hot lines, but they don't do that anymore. I guess it costs too much money to make those two little lines. I don't know. Sometimes you wonder about these engineers, what they have going on in their head, what's good, what's bad, because that made the most sense. You have a cold line and a hot line. Logical, totally logical. You know, if you want to check it hot, it should be hot. You want to check it cold, it's cold. Motorcycles, racing motorcycles were like that too. They have a cold and a hot line. But I don't know, I guess it's too complicated for most people, so they just went to one. Nevada Frog said, should I buy a 99 Chevy Prism for 500 bucks? It runs, it shifts. I don't trust Chevy, but hey, it's pretty much a Toyota Corolla, so it seems like a good idea. That's 145,000 miles. What the heck? You say it runs and shifts, buy it. A lot of that is a Toyota Corolla. I mean, runs, buy it. You want to rent a car today? You're going to pay 500 bucks to rent a car for three or four days, so what the heck? See how long it lasts. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You said it seems to run fine, it goes down the road. What the heck? Why not? Five hundred bucks is nothing, and it is basically a Toyota. Buy it. You never know how long the thing's going to last. You know. Make sure one thing. Make sure it's got an actual title. Sometimes people sell cars for five hundred bucks, or stolen cars, or don't have a legitimate title from it that you can't legally register. Just make sure you can legally register it. Otherwise, you're throwing your five hundred bucks away if you got a vehicle you can't register on the road. And I've seen that happen to a lot of my customers over the years. They thought what a great deal, and then there was no title with the car, and they couldn't register it to legally drive it down the road. Squirrely Stock says, why is my flywheel making noise? Got no way, Crown Vic. Why would my flywheel flex plate be making noise? Maybe the mechanic didn't use thread locker when he worked on it? Is it possible to tighten it without dropping the transmission using the access panel? Now, they have to have the access panel because you got to take the transmission off of the engine when you take it apart. And the only way you can unbolt it is through the access panel. So yeah, start there and pray that. He didn't over tighten them, which can warp it, and it's going to make noise. I even see where the flex plates are kind of break when the guys are jamming the transmission back in the engine, bolting it in after they do work on the car. That's why anytime anybody out there has your transmission worked on, listen closely, drive it right as soon as you get it back, because if they didn't do something right, it's going to show up pretty fast. And then you can say, I'm not accepting this work. It's making that noise. You didn't do the job. Do it right. Because once you pay them and get your money in their hands, generally half the guys, they don't want to ever see you again. They don't want to come back. You didn't fix it right. Realize one thing. In the United States, something like 33% of the automatic transmissions that are rebuilt at these chains aren't rebuilt right and have to be done over one or two or three times before they work right. They're very complex things. The guys doing the work, a lot of the guys, the skilled guys, Guys, they're older like me. A lot of them have retired. They get guys in that don't know what they're doing now, and they do a lousy job rebuilding their transmissions, doing the work. It's a dirty job, pulling those things apart, putting together. There's no working room on modern cars, so it's a dirty job that hardly anybody wants to do, and often they get unskilled people doing it, and it isn't done right. But you could take the panel off, get a torque wrench, tighten them up right, and pray just some of them were too loose, or even too tight. You might want to loosen them one at a time, and then tighten them with a torque wrench exactly the right amount, so you know they're not too tight, because too tight can warp it too. Cadillac like Man says, how can I regain the air ride suspension? My dad's 91 STS. I put a lot of money in it, and I bought a shock strut combo for all four wheels. Now it feels like a truck and it rides like crap. Where can I get a shock strut combo comparable with a 91 STS to make it feel like glass like it used to drive? All right, yeah, here's the problem. It's an old car, right? You doubt if you can get OEM stuff for it at the dealer. No car manufacturer has to make parts for very long in the United States. Legally, they only have to make them for the warranty period. So if it's three years, they only have to make parts for three years. And they actually don't even have to make them as long as they're available somewhere that they could replace them under warranty. That's all that matters. You're best bet, truthfully, would be go to Hemmings Motor online. People sell just about everything in the world. See if anybody can get some original old stock for that thing. 
that are new and replace it because they're special ones that did ride quite well. Now, if you can't do that, my advice is talk to a suspension guy and say, what's the best thing you have for ride on this? And he'll give you all kinds of choices. You might be able to find it in Hemi's. Guys have about everything there. But if you can't, talk to a speed shop, aftermarket guys, and see what they say about air shocks and adjustable, which ones would ride the best. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.